This is the Crowd Crux Crowdfunding Podcast with Sal Brigman, where we cover everything you need to know to launch a successful crowdfunding campaign. We speak with proven entrepreneurs who've raised money from the crowd and want to teach you how to do the same. Stay tuned because we're about to reveal how to launch your dream project with your host, Sal Brigman. Before we get started with this podcast episode, I want to take a second to introduce you to my friends at FulfillRight. If you need help shipping out your Kickstarter or Indiegogo perks or rewards, FulfillRight is the absolute best company for you. I've been working with them for a while and I can vouch for their services. They make it dead simple and take all of the headache out of shipping out all of those boxes, all of those orders to your backers and your customers. If you want to check them out, go to fulfillright.com at F-U-L-F-I-L-L-R-I-T-E.com. What up, crowdfunders? Salvador Brigman here. Thank you and welcome back to the Crowdfunding Demystified podcast. Now going into 2018, excited for the new things that are in store, whether that's launching a new crowdfunding campaign, could be growing your business, maybe getting the word out more, um, all of that kind of stuff. I'm here for you this year to help you stay true to your goals and to help you stay true with your, your marketing endeavors and to make sure that you're out there and surrounding yourself with success stories. You know, we're really only as good as the education we have available to us. And we're only as good and our potential is, is, is in a certain way limited by the people we surround ourselves with. So by, by having guests on this show, my goal number one is to bring to you the best possible information when it comes to launching a crowdfunding campaign. But I also want to surround you with people that are just like you and that are every single day raising money successfully on websites like Kickstarter and Indiegogo. These are entrepreneurs that are building a crowd. They're getting the word out about their business, about their products. They're networking with manufacturers. You know, they're really doing it. We have so many like entrepreneurs, you know, people who aren't really serious about entrepreneurship. But what I love about crowdfunding and the Kickstarter marketplace is that we're dealing with people who are building and creating physical items. You know, they're selling physical things online. And once someone supports a campaign, they actually get to open up the box, they get to try out this product, and they can leave their feedback. It's really the core engine of innovation in my in my experience, and we're seeing many new cool products coming out. I think we're going to see a lot of cool new ones um, in 2018. So for today's podcast episode, I brought on the team at Vinci 2.0. This is the world's first standalone smart wireless headphones. These guys, at the time of our recording, raised over $560,000 on Kickstarter off a $20,000 goal. And they also had a first campaign. Um, Their initial campaign was for Vinci 1.0, and they raised $987,000 on Kickstarter. So these guys are veterans by now. Um, They've seen a ton of success. They have many, many backers, nearly 4,000 right now. So when, when when you're hearing from them today, I think that this is a prime example of how you can actually build an audio company off of Kickstarter. You can actually build a hardware company via Kickstarter and crowdfunding. These guys are a stellar example. They have over 60 engineers now working on the product as a result of funding rounds and as a result of running successful Kickstarter campaigns. So you can do it too. My goal with this interview is to get you, you know, some of the nuggets that this, this project used to actually be successful, some of the things that you should be paying attention to. And I also want to encourage you to go into the archives of this podcast and listen to some of the other shows, some of the other entrepreneurs that I've had on. I think you're gonna, it's gonna be well worth your time. Before we get into this episode, I just want to mention one thing, and that is if you want to start out 2018 right. I, I've had, you know, over the years, many people who have emailed me as a result of being on one of my email lists, um, me sending them free content, free videos, blog posts, podcasts, and them saying that that was an instrumental part in them launching their campaign. That that, that made a major difference because it gave them access 
to the right information as we were talking about earlier. So if you are interested in becoming a subscriber and staying up to date with my new content, the new stuff I have coming out, I'm gonna have be having books come out this upcoming year, a lot of great new stuff, um, new products, new blog posts, new videos, et cetera. You can go to crowdcrux.com slash subscribe, enter your email address there, and you'll gain access to my weekly newsletter. This is a free newsletter I send out, um, you know, some of my new content, also sharing some updates, all that kind of stuff. So if you want to join the community there, it's crowdcrux.com slash subscribe. Without further ado, let's get into today's podcast episode. Kathy, welcome to the podcast. I am excited to have you on and talk about Vinci 2.0. This campaign has raised over $500,000, also a great success. Your first campaign on Kickstarter, the first one raised, I believe, what was it, over $900,000. So you guys are Kickstarter veterans by now. So thank you so much for coming on the podcast. And I'm looking forward to getting into a little bit about this product, what it is, and also how you guys have been seeing just such massive success on the platform. Yeah, thank you so for having me here. Um, happy to help and happy to help explain, you know, some of the tips and tricks behind the project. I feel like there are a lot of a lot of tricks we're going to get out of this interview. Um, where exactly are you hailing in from? I am actually in New York. So our company is headquartered in Beijing, but we have a branch in New York that mainly handles the marketing and the business development. So I'm in New York. What's what's sort of your role here at the company and with the project? Yeah, so I'm the business director of um, the U.S. portion, and for the project, I mainly have handled pretty much everything from like PR to digital ads to. Is the business uh, director you know, kind of like organizing the the project? Or are you kind of wearing like a lot of hats here? Like, what are you doing sort of on on the daily? Yeah, a lot of hats. So, I mean, the campaign is definitely one portion of it, and for our project, I mean, with the SIM cards, you know, it's looking for partnerships with different cellular carriers. Uh, with the music content, you know, looking for music partners there. So a lot of different hats. <laughs> when did you join the company? Almost two years now. Uh, maybe like one year and eight months. Yeah. Okay. And you guys started in 2014? Correct. September of 2014. Okay, so in terms of the the company here, I want to give the listeners an idea of it seems like you're, you know, this large organization, you have 60 employees and engineers around the world. That is a, that's a really big standing. Um walk me through sort of the development of the company a little bit. So you had the first campaign, which I know is a massive success. Were you guys like an established company before that? You know, what product lines do you have out there? Sure, yeah. Um, so, as you mentioned, we were founded in September of 2014, and we actually launched our, our first like beta production batch. So we went through the whole process of the design to like manufacturing to actually shipping the products, but only for the China market. So it was a it was a beta product. Um, there was a lot of things that needed to be improved on there. So when we launched on Kickstarter in uh, November of 2016, we actually, that was our upgraded 1.5 version that we launched for the global market. And we used um, music streaming services that were globally recognized. And we also um, changed the AI to an English version. So there was a lot of tweaking that we did at the hardware too. We, we uh, improved the weight. So we did a lot of improvements there. Um, but we did have quite a we found a quite a bit of success in China when we launched. So when we took it uh, global, it was kind of we needed to do a lot more research into you know the the different markets out there and what their their main pain points were or where we could really find um, places where we could succeed for a project. But the product, because we had this kind of test batch production before, it helped a lot with with I guess giving us momentum and also giving us a lot of. Uh, a lot of traction, you know, getting to see some feedback here. In terms of the actual founders of the company, where did they actually get those funds to start this? Because I know, obviously, with the first Kickstarter campaign, that goes into the initial batch of Vinci 1.0. But in terms of actually being able to hire all these entrepreneurs, how did how were they able to fund that venture? We had gone through a seed round, and then we went. We also went through a Series A. The founders actually went back to China to raise these funds in Beijing. So before we launched, I mean, the the seed and the uh, Series A mainly covered a lot of our, you know, employee expenses and also our first batch of production. Um, 
And so we did have some funds to cover for the 1.5, especially for some of the pre-marketing materials. But a lot of it also was very thankful to our backers for making the products, the the 1.5 project, such a success. And and why audio? You know, we we've seen so many new audio products coming out, not only on Kickstarter but also just in the general marketplace. You know, seeing Apple's new earbuds and all these different products. Why is it that you're so passionate about audio? Why is that a focus for the team? You know, really, audio has not, if you think about it, audio really has not changed that much um, ever since, I guess, the Walkman and to the, well, it's changed a lot since the Walkman and then to the iPod. But like nowadays with the headphones, you know, it's still just a hardware device. Uh, Beats is like that, Bose is like that. And a lot of potential can be seen here in the audio industry, especially with the headphones industry, because it's not changed that much. It's only changed for like the design aspect of the outside and what the appearance looks like. Um, whether it's a uh, you know square or a circle or you know diamond or all decked up, but what we really wanted to focus on was the customer listening experience, and that's something that a lot of headphones haven't focused on before. So we saw a lot of potential in this area. Uh, for example, like integrating the hardware and the software experience to have a completely standalone device. That way, you don't need to you know pair your phone every time, or you don't need to connect wires to your phone uh, be- between your phone and your headphones and it makes the listening experience much easier. Which is totally annoying as well. If you're in the gym or if you're doing anything like CrossFit or you're running, to have like these these earbuds that also have wires is really annoying. So to be able to have something that's wire free or syncs automatically, it's gonna really help a lot. Particularly if it has like noise cancellation, all these different features. So I'd love to ask you before we get into the the inner workings of this campaign and sort of what you've been seeing has been working well with Kick. Starter, I want to ask you. So, for Vinci 2.0, what ex- what actually is this? Like, if I'm a listener, I'm someone listening to this podcast. Can you describe the benefits of the product, what they would use it for, and just tease us a little bit uh, of what this is? Sure. So, Vinci 2.0, I mean, is essentially the world's first standalone smart wireless headphones. Now, what that means is that you can really just leave your phone at home, leave your phone in the gym locker and just take Vinci and you'll be able to stream music directly to Vinci. You'll be able to take calls, answer messages, have fitness trackers. Um, and it's basically that that all of those features all in one. Wait, so I, I don't I don't have to bring my phone with me like this has the components in the headphone. Yes. So you can think of it like Apple's smartwatch, but in a pair of headphones. I mean, with like Apple's new smartwatch, you kind of need to have another pair of headphones anyways. But with Vinci, what we've done is basically just combine it in a pair of headphones. Okay, I see. I think that'd be great too, because if you're going, you're doing one of these activities, you're going to the gym, or you're going on a run, you don't want to be di- really disturbed by people. <laughs> I hate to say it, like I love people, but you don't always want to be bombarded with text messages and social media and all this kind of stuff. To be able to have something like that that kind of leaves you a little bit disconnected, but also access to your favorite apps, I think that's that's going to be really cool. And it, to, honestly, it's a testament to um, the funding that you guys have gotten. I mean, looking here, five hundred and sixty-seven thousand dollars on Kickstarter. So it seems like other people are also resonating with that. Yeah. Well, I mean, you can, you can take calls, you can still get messages, but the thing is, I mean, the beneficial part is you don't have to look down. Right. You can voice control it. You can say, hi, Vinci, read my text messages or hi, Vinci, um, you know, how many steps did I take today? Hi, Vinci, uh, call Annie. So it just makes the experience much easier because when you're running, when you're working out, you know, you don't want to look at you don't want to look down at a screen. Uh, it's one, not safe. And two, it's inconvenient. So, so can you tell just- me a little bit about the the actual Kickstarter campaign here? So you guys internally, you know, you've made a great first product. You're working on your second one. You recognize this sort of need in the marketplace, and you've really assembled a team uh, around that to actually put this product into the world. For the Kickstarter campaign, what did the pre-launch look like there? Like, how is it you were able to rack up so much funding in such a short period of time? Can you clue us in there? Yeah, so it's definitely not as easy as it may look. <laughs> a lot of preparation goes on beforehand. Um, I would say leave yourself enough time, at least at least one and a half months, uh, two months preferable, two I mean two plus months preferable, um, because there's just a lot to do. There's there's PR, um, pitching the PR, arranging some of the prototypes and units, review units for them uh, to check out. 
you know, looking for the right press to reach out to. If, you know, you're, you're not in the audio category and you're reading, even if you want to reach out to like Forbes, but you're reaching out to someone who normally writes about like food, um, then it doesn't really make sense if you're in another category. So that's also very important. Um, another thing is making sure you're able to collect enough emails beforehand. So the email conversion rate, I would say, is the highest one um, for us and amongst a lot of different campaigns uh, to have to um, to be able to collect it with like a teaser page. And then afterwards, when you launch the campaign, be able to just send a blast email um, a few days before and also a few weeks before and also on launch date, reminding people to come come back to your campaign. And that way you already kind of know around how many people would be interested in your campaign and around, you know, from an average conversion rate of launch day. I'm speaking to the crowdfunders in the audience who have already launched a Kickstarter campaign or have actually even successfully run a campaign. And the reason is, I think you will understand this pain point most. And that is, when you finally do raise money on Kickstarter or Indiegogo, the hardest part is not collecting the cash. The hardest part is shipping out all of those perks and rewards to your backers. It is a nightmare, my friends. It's a lot of spreadsheets, it's a lot of headache, and it's a lot of stress. That's why I recommend BackerKit. If you have not heard of BackerKit, they help you collect surveys, they help you collect data, and the entire fulfillment process is just so much easier and so many less spreadsheets when you use their software. You can check them out at backerkit.com and use CrowdCrux for a special discount. From doing some research, you'll know how many people will be able to back that day. And the first day is very important. The first I would say three days are the most important part of the campaign because that's when your campaign gets the most visibility. Um, that's also when, you know, if, if you can reach a good number, then people trust your campaign. If you can pass your funding goal, then people are like, oh, uh, it looks like this campaign is actually going to be a, an actual, like an actual reality, an actual real product. So that was very important as well. Um, video, video takes at least six weeks. Um, <laughs> We were a little bit actually pressured on time and we started a little bit late. And that's one thing I think we would love to, you know, not do in the next next <laughs> future. Um, but video is, is very important. It takes a long time to write the storyboard, put the story together, make sure you have the get the right point across to your audience um, and make sure it's not too long because uh, then people start to lose focus. Um for an entrepreneur who's listening right now, you know, we're hearing all of this. Okay, we need to focus on preparation. Okay, we need a really compelling video. One of the things that stood out to me was you talking about this email list that you have to build, which you're going to announce this campaign to when it's live. And you talked a little bit about conversion rates. I'd love it if you go a little bit deeper here. So what do you mean by conversion rates? And, and what do you usually suggest that people should um, expect with these types of conversion rates for campaigns? Yeah, I mean, it really depends kind of on, um, it depends a little bit on your category, but it also depends on like how many, how much you're looking to raise. I would just say um, on the first day, I'm just hope to expect to get as many emails as you can. Uh, and that way you can kind of like scale back and measure. Like I would say it really varies because I've seen some campaigns from like 5% conversion to like, 15% is, it's amazing to reach 15, but I mean, and I can't really say like our number, but I've, I'm just saying like in a range there, you can kind of maybe research a little bit into your category, research a little bit into similar campaigns and, you know, see, oh, I would expect maybe like this 10% conversion rate on the first day for my campaigns and then be like, oh, so that means that this day I'd be able to kind of raise this much and already surpass my goal by this much, um, that way, you know, I can repitch my PR and tell them, you know, I've already surpassed my goal by like a thousand percent. Like, um, this product is going to be amazing. So, by conversion rates, you mean if we have a hundred people on the email list, a five percent conversion would just be, you know, five of that a hundred end up becoming backers. Or if you have, you know, a thousand, yeah. you would extrapolate that out. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I also think too, you know, there's something to be said for email opens. Um, because not everyone that you send an email to is actually going to open that email. 
you know, yeah. um, I think convert, you know, open rates can vary from 30% of the people. You know, if you have a hundred people on an email list, maybe wow. only 30 to 40 are actually opening the emails that you're sending. Have you guys had any strategy with that, getting people to open the emails or have you just sort of had a, you know, a normal, like we're going to set, we're going to blast this out to everyone on our list. We're not going to segment it in that way. Um, yes. Yeah, so segmenting is definitely very important. We do have uh, a, a separation between our active uh, active emails and, you know, inactive emails. And also one challenge for us is like we use MailChimp and sometimes that is recognized as spam. And so we would definitely like to improve there as well. Um, but I would say you can definitely sort them out into active and inactive, but on the first day, it'd be a little bit hard to tell. So I'm speaking from like a general general email list. Um, that was kind of what I was going for before. It's like without separation. Before. Okay. Um, when looking at the different ways that people discover your campaign, you, know, you mentioned having people um, on your email list. You mentioned in the first three days doing well, I assume to also rope in regular Kickstarter backers. Of, of all the different sources, what has been the number one or the number two most responsible for people discovering your campaign and funding it? Hmm, that's a good question. It kind of works together. I would say there's two big parts. Um, one is definitely Kickstarter's own platform. Kickstarter has a great community of backers and their pages, such as like the popular page, their recommended page is very important. Um, so their organic traffic is very, very good. It's very important to be able to get on those pages if you can. The second part is Facebook ads have been doing very well for us uh, as consumer products in audio. I'm, I don't know about, like I've heard that there's other uh, projects where Google ads works better, but for us at least, like Facebook ads has been doing really well. And it's like a combination of these two that we're able to be able to, eh, able to be, to be able to like get on Kickstarters, like popular pages. So it, it works together, but I would say these are the two biggest parts, um, both before, well, Facebook ads before and during, and then Kickstarter um, during campaign. I do have to ask you some more questions about Facebook ads. I also did want to ask you though, so Kathy, as you've been working on this project and you also saw the first launch of the first Kickstarter campaign for the first Vinci, um, what's been the, the, the highlight here? Like, what's, what's been your favorite part about working on these projects, um, either with your job or maybe the skill sets you get to use? What's been your favorite part? I would say being able to touch upon like all parts of the business. I would say being able to work on the video, for example, and the creative elements and being able to write the storyboard, but then also being able to like work on the actual product and put into feedback, like translating customers' feedback into the design of the product um, and really working not only, you know, from, from internal like company side, but also bringing in a lot of these outside components back into the company. Uh, I think it's really, it's really helpful. And I've definitely really understood that, you know, the customer is, the customer is a king, like the customer is very important. And, and whatever the customer says is essentially, you know, and right. use, using that feedback as well, I imagine to guide the product as it goes in the future and what you can choose to incorporate, or maybe your marketing, you know, using that feedback. I think that's really a, a great part of Kickstarter and having such a public campaign there. Um, yeah. Because the backers are really, um, they're, they're great. They're really great. They've given a huge amount of feedback, um, both positive and like constructive feedback. And they're just very active. Uh, so, yeah, great community. And for you personally, what has been the most challenging part of working on these projects? Um, it could be maybe something, an event that happened with the campaign you've had to deal with. It could be, you know, maybe pushing your skills to, to the limit and really growing. What's been something challenging for you as you've been working on these projects? Mm -hmm. I'd say one big portion that was a little bit, uh, that was pretty challenging was the the shipping component, um, the fulfillment. So actually post campaign, uh, because we exceeded our expectations by quite a bit. Uh, so we needed to do That's a little an bit. That's an understatement. 
<laughs> yeah, we needed to do a little bit of uh, focusing on the post campaign fulfillment part. Um, but we, we we ended up shipping all our backers. It was just a matter of it got delayed a little bit. Uh, but that's expected. Actually, I would say the majority of campaigns on Kickstarter are delayed. And while we don't, you know, hope for that, it it did happen. So we had to deal with a lot of customer um, customer requests, customer uh, messages, and we ended up setting up uh, Zendesk, which is a great tool for customer service. And it just streamlined a lot of the process uh, for communication be- between us and the backers. Okay, so you use Zendex to help with all the communication. We're using yeah. any other kind of tools uh, throughout the campaign to help with that? Help with communication. Or to help with uh, the fulfillment aspects. So we actually did fulfillment in-house, which was also probably we're looking for other options. So. I could recommend something. I would say, you know, if you have a lot of SKUs, which we ended up having 16, I would recommend finding some some companies. There's a lot that could help with, like, uh, the pledge management of post-campaign. Um, I believe there's two. One is called Backer Kit. One is called CrowdOx. Um, from my my understanding and my doing a little bit of research, talking to just com- some companies, uh, they're pretty good. Um, so we're also looking into them too. Okay, very cool. I was looking at your first campaign, and I noticed that you guys for Facebook advertising used uh, Jellup. I had to interrupt this podcast episode because I want to introduce you to my friends at the Gadget Flow. Their product discovery platform reaches 22 million people per month. They've helped more than 5,000 crowdfunding campaigns thus far, and they have a social media following of more than 700,000 followers. If you want to gain access to their marketplace and list your own product, you can go to thegadgetflow.com slash submit and list your project today. Which is a very you know popular firm. There are a few Facebook advertising ones, um, which really kind of jump started your pledges there. For for the second project, did you guys go with the this this agency again? Did you do your own Facebook ads? What, what was sort of powering that component of the project? Yeah. Uh, so for the first one and for the second one, we did use Shell Up, and we also we also have been doing in, like ads internally as well. Uh, we just would like as well um, these companies that have specialty in these areas to be able to jump on and help, especially because they mostly just deal with crowdfunding and they're very experienced in this area. But for us as well, I mean, Shell Up, they're, they're very good, but they only hop on at the beginning and the end of the campaign. So a lot of the the, the middle we had to do. I also noticed uh, another company, another agency that you guys were using that I actually haven't come across before, or if I have, you know, I haven't uh, made note of it, uh, called CrowdCreate. Can you, how did you how did you find that company and what what have they done for you? Yeah, so they actually reached out to us. Some of these companies like they have great they have a great backer list and they have great backer um, uh, sort of like connections. Uh, so we just decided to try them out for this this new campaign. We didn't use them for the previous one. Uh, this new one, we try to find a couple more partners that we that could help market the campaign along with us. Um, so they were one of them and there was, I believe also Eventis partners, uh, funded today as well. So we, um, looked into other partners and seeing how, you know, we could strategically benefit, uh, together. Mm-hmm. When you're, when you're sort of going after these, these agencies and these partners that can help with the project, what's sort of your mindset there? Like, are you guys using these campaigns to sort of get media exposure for the brand? Are you expecting to earn large amounts of money from the projects or like, how does this fit into your, your business model, I guess? Yeah. I mean, we would love to be able to, you know, grow the campaign, um, just kind of be for, for branding as well for uh, media and just get the idea across that these are not, you know, traditional pair of headphones, that these are something new, that these are really going to, you know, become a competitor to like AirPods and Google's new headphones. And this is something that is not seen in traditional headphones at all. Uh, so that's mainly, I would say, a lot of uh, branding components. And then also for, uh, we would love to be a, 
as much of a success as possible in the Kickstarter community. So Kathy, where can people check out more about Vinci 2.0? I also see that this campaign is currently ongoing. You have 27 days to go. Where can people check it out? Yeah, so definitely on Kickstarter, but also our website, which is en.vinci.im, M as in Mary. Um, yeah. Do you have any announcements uh, that are going to be coming out in these next 27 days, whether it's you know stretch goals or new th- updates or anything like that you can share with the audience? We do, actually. We have one coming out today. Uh, which I'm about to push out right after this call. Um, so that one, we're going to have a, a stretch goal when we for a million dollars. Ambitious, but we're aiming for it. And we will have a couple of more updates. I mean, we do have a holiday special that's going on right now. We're also going to be at CES. Uh, booth number 51680, if any of you want to drop by. Yeah, but in these last 27 days, I would say we're going to aim to have as many updates as we can and we've been trying to improve the communication with our backers so pushing more frequent updates as well there so what are they going to get if you are able to hit that milestone of one million dollars or any of the other stretch goals yes so um we're going to be giving out free carrying cases uh for the headphones as well as uh, premium tip earbuds very cool um, one of the, I have one more, one or two more questions for you here about the project. Um, the, the first one I had was w- when you look at this campaign and comparing it to your first one, Vinci 1.0 versus this new one, Vinci 2.0, w- w- is there any differences here or things you would have done differently? You know, for someone who's just starting out there and you could talk to them, um, could you pass on one bit of advice, maybe something you would do differently or something you learned with these two different projects, something you can share advice wise with the listeners? Yeah, <laughs> I would definitely say don't procrastinate. Make sure you are ready to launch. Uh, make sure you can leave at least three days for like Kickstarter, go through the review process of your your campaign. But longer than three days, actually, maybe a week. They say three days, but I would say like a week just in case anything happens. Um, also give at least like two weeks for your video to be ready. So just be as prepared as possible and give yourself enough time for preparation. Well said. I think that we've covered a lot of different points, whether it's email marketing, you know, Facebook ads, um, assembling a team, an agency, making sure you give yourself a lot of time. So thank you for coming on the show and, and sharing all of that. Um, I think you guys have certainly proven there is a lot of demand for this kind of a product. Um, you've been able to build a community on the platform. Are you going to be doing any more launches after you fulfill this one? Uh, are you going to have a third Kickstarter campaign in the future? I think um, we might. Uh, it's definitely a great place for for like it, people who love innovation and the early adopters and the community just getting all their their early feedback before we go into mass um, for funding or not for funding is just great. Awesome. Well, thank you for coming on the show and sharing all of that. We'll have to have you back um, and good luck with the remaining days in your campaign. Thank you, Sal. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Crowdfunding Demystified Podcast. Again, my name is Salvador Brigman. Thank you for joining me on this podcast episode. And I hope that you got something out of today's episode that you have now a strategy you can employ for your own campaign. Maybe now you know what to focus on, you know, to focus on going into a whole new crowdfunding campaign, maybe a pitfall to avoid that you, you got something out of spending time with me here today. There are so many episodes here in the archives of the Crowdfunding Demystified show. I invite you to dive into some of those and to listen to some of the the real stories of other entrepreneurs just like you who are successfully raising money from the crowd. I hope that this year we can bring more success to Kickstarter campaigns, that we can really improve the success rates on Kickstarter and with crowdfunding in general. And I think that the number one way to do that, just in my opinion, maybe I am a little bit biased, (laughs) but I think the number one way to do that 
is by bringing good education and by making people aware of what they need to focus on. You know, if you're trying to do something, you're only as good as what you're aware of. If you're trying to play chess, like it's, you can figure it out, but if you have strategies that work, you know, particular moves when you're playing chess that you know are going to be effective or a certain strategy to go about playing chess, you're going to win more matches. It's kind of a, a nerd example or a nerd analogy, but I actually loved chess when you know I was in high school and I still play chess to this day. Even with any other kind of game, if you have a strategy, you're going to be more successful than someone who's just trying to figure it out and kind of throwing you know uh, spaghetti at the wall and trying to make it, it stick. Start throwing ideas at the wall and trying to make it stick. So that's my goal here with this podcast. And I hope that I, in this year, will improve the chance that you, the person listening, are successful with your campaign. A very small way that I can do that is via the new content that I put out. So if you're interested in gaining regular updates once a week about the new videos, the new blog posts, the new podcasts I have coming out, take a second to go to crowdcrux.com slash subscribe and enter your email address there. These are free updates and free content to keep you in the know when it comes to marketing, crowdfunding, things you should be aware of. So that's crowdcrux.com slash subscribe. It also does not hurt to subscribe to this podcast. Thank you so much for joining me on this episode and I will see you next time.